journalists who would send reporters down to the border to cover what was going on. There were so many people dying in Juarez. It was the most dangerous city in the world at the time. There were thousands of people who were being killed there, um, dozens of people dying every single day in horrific ways. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Gray Jabesi, and this is another episode of the Gray Ave Podcast. Uh, you can catch the Gray Ave Podcast on all sorts of platforms. Uh, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, SoundCloud, and on my website, grayjabesi.com, where you can learn even a, a bit more. So today is a special podcast. Like you know, the goal or the idea of this podcast is to speak to those uh, type of people who have skin in the game, who are talking what they are doing. They're really in it. They have either they are experienced, or they're experts, or you know they just they just they're just too much to handle. And today's guest is no different. We got Ben Swan, uh, the most. Uh, you know, he's a very controversial guy, uh, in a good way, and an independent thinker. So. This was an incredible conversation with Ben, and for those of you who are not familiar with Ben Swan, come on, man, uh, you might have to do some uh, some Google search. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of a description. Uh, according to Wikipedia, Benjamin Swan is an American television news anchor, political commentator, and journalist. He has worked as a sports producer, news journalist, and uh, producer, and managing editor on network affiliates. Fox and RT America of the Russian state-owned TV network RT. He received a number of television journalism awards by 2018. Swan created the series Reality Check, which he used, he used to espouse conspiracy theories such as Pizza Gate and those surrounding the Aurora, Colorado, and Sandy Hook elementary school shootings and the 9/11 attacks. So he has. Uh, ben is very controversial. He, has, he, he thinks in his own way, and he does things his own way. So we had a, an incredible chat from, uh, on s different types of subjects, you know, from how he got started uh, to become a journalist, and his journey is really, really uh, breathtaking in terms of, you know, he started a completely different person with different goals and, you know, ending up in, uh, in journalism, and still he continues uh, to do it his own way. So we talk a lot about you know his childhood uh, childhood dreams, uh, which partly was to become a church leader, but he ended up uh, you know uh, becoming a journalist. And uh, we talk about today's news. How do you digest or how do you create uh, a good space or a good source of news for yourself? Considering that you know we have too too many news sources, and there's this kind of thing called fake news these days. And we talk about some conspiracies and his, his thoughts on things like vaccines, which are you know this kind of subjects have created different topics. Uh, and conversation online with people opposing uh, on both ends. So it was incredible to hear his thoughts on that. Uh, and I would like to hear your thoughts on it as well. Uh, I'll put this on YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, I would like to see, uh, to hear from you in the comments. So I'll leave it to that. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, we do, man, we discussed a lot of things uh, about uh, homeschooling because he was homeschooled and his kids are also homeschooled and they travel with and all sorts of different things so i, I know you guys are gonna love this uh just remember to share it with your friends and family on the twitters on uh on instagram facebook all sorts of places i hope you enjoy it and welcome to the table ben swan hey there great ben how are you i'm good how are you can't complain, man. Great to, yeah, great <laughs> to have good. you here, man. Um, Thank you. Um, where, where are you based out of? I am based in Cape Town, South Africa. Oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah. It's great. Where, where are you at the moment? In Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, that's where you've always been based, right? Or are you from Texas? That's where I, yeah, 
based out of there, but I'm originally from Texas. That's right. All oh, right. Awesome. All right. So how is the life right now being a journalist still in 2018? Any difference if you do the comparison with a couple of years ago? Um, I would say it's, it's more difficult. It gets more difficult every year. Uh, and, ju- and that's a lot of the product of just media constantly creating an environment where everyone's pitted against each other. So it's very, very difficult to get any kind of good information out to the public. Right. So I think for a lot of people right now, just to keep in mind of my audience, uh, some of them who do not know you, how do you, so say you, sure. if you, if you had to go to South Africa today and you go to a party yeah. and it happens that a lot of people there do not know who you are, how do you introduce yourself? Oh, I just introduce myself as a, as an investigative journalist and a broadcaster. And I kind of explain my, my journey to them as far as, um, having been a mainstream media journalist and now an independent journalist. Right. And what, what mainstream, um, how, in, in what mainstream kind of uh, journalism have you done? Like which kind of companies have you worked with? Sure. Well, I've, I've worked for um, CBS news stations, Fox news stations, and NBC news stations. And RT? You've never worked with RT before? And I, and I have worked with RT, yes, as a freelancer. I was never an employee there, but I, I did freelance with RT for about almost a year. Yeah. Right. So your story is very compelling to me. I mean, and obviously it kind of makes sense how you, you, you were brought up a little bit from what I've read to where you are now. So if I'm getting yeah. my, if I got my research correctly here, you were homeschooled and had a bachelor's degree at age 15, right? That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> All right. How, how, and your, your master's degree at 16? Yes. How was that experience? Yes. How, how did that happen? Well, it, it happened because, uh, so when we were homeschooled and I was growing up uh, in, actually in New Mexico, so I was originally born in Texas and my parents moved to New Mexico because homeschooling was illegal in Texas at the time. And so we lived in New Mexico uh, right across the state line and uh, we didn't know anyone else who was homeschooled at the time. And so going through that process, uh, my mom didn't really know, you know, what she was doing as far as uh, creating curriculum and how it would work. We, I attended a, basically a private school through the mail. Uh, the school was in Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, but we lived in New Mexico. And so we just didn't take any breaks. We didn't have summers off. We didn't have breaks at, around holidays. And we just worked every single day, five days a week, and wound up getting way, way ahead uh, in terms of the, the school schedule. And so I actually started high school when I was 10 years old. Uh, I graduated when I was 12, started college at 12, I graduated uh, from Brigham Young University at 15 with a bachelor's in liberal arts and then went and got a master's degree from California State University, Dominguez Hills, with a, a major in history. Right. So if you then say homeschooling, it means, I think, a lot of different things from a lot of people. It and, does. And I wonder what it means to you. Well, so, so I actually homeschool my kids as well. I have five kids and, and they're all homeschooled and they actually go through the same programs that I went through, the same private school. Um, but again, it's, it's done for, over the mail and online now. Of course, there was no online when I was being homeschooled, but now a lot of it's online. Uh, there are high schools in Chicago. But what, what's different about the way that I homeschool my kids from the way I was homeschooled is we actually follow a, a regular calendar, a regular school year um, like everyone else. And so – but but – you know, you're correct when you say that homeschooling means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so in our case, it did not mean making up curriculum. It did not mean that my parents created the curriculum. My parents were actually more tutors than they were the teachers uh, because we would have accredited teachers who we would send all of our work to and they would grade the lessons and they would send it back to us. We would have an actual GPA. We had an actual diploma when we were done from those schools. So there's lots of ways to do it. There's no necessarily wrong way or right way. We just did it in a way that was more like attending a private school than, than being homeschooled. We just happened to do it from our home. Okay, so you, what is the actual difference? I, I wonder how strict can it be to, to the level that you can uh, focus really and have a curriculum as a, a regular school system? Like, do you really sit in class the whole day, you know, get things done? And since you were doing it as well, being a parent, it must be really challenging because then it's easier to kind of 
you know, let off the responsibility of your kids' education to the teachers, but it's different when it's actually being done at home and you have to be fully responsible all the time. So I wonder if you want to do things like travel or work sometime and to have to balance the responsibility of your children's education. Sure. Well, one thing that I found is that um, it's actually – there's a lot more freedom uh, when you homeschool. And one of the reasons for that is because when, you, when you're focused on the work the way that, that we're focused on it and, – and this is true for all homeschoolers. So there's actually a study that was done that looked at public school students and it looked – and private school students and then it looked at uh, homeschool students. And what it found was that the – that one hour of homeschooling – was the equivalent of three hours in a public school in terms of what you actually learn and retain. And so you can actually accomplish uh, a full day's work in homeschooling three to four hours in what you would do in terms of nine to ten hours in a public school setting, in also including homework and those kinds of things. So it's a little bit different in terms of that really focused time when you're really focused on uh, the study and, and learning uh, specific principles. You also have to remember that any teacher will tell you that in a classroom setting, the fewer students you have, the more one-on-one -on -one attention a student gets, the better that they do. And so a lot of teachers fight for smaller classroom sizes because they know that they can give students more attention that way. Well, when you're homeschooling, obviously, in my case, there's five kids, and so you're very limited in terms of the, the amount or the number of students, but also able to really focus on each one of them in terms of their learning abilities, um, their strengths, their weaknesses. And so in that sense, the system works well. Now, for our family, it, it doesn't hold us back in terms of travel because we can take school with us when we travel. Um, I actually speak around the country quite a bit. Um, I speak about cryptocurrencies. I speak about uh, media. And what I always do is I take one of my kids uh, to almost every event that I do. And so one of them will travel with me uh, when we go. And it's a chance for them to learn about different parts of the country and to see different things and to, to learn about different culture, even within the United States, different culture. So, you know, I think there's a lot of advantages to it on a lot of different levels, but it really comes down to what works well for your family, and that's what works well for ours. Right. So what, what, what's very interesting to me there is that what you said about, you know, having your kids to travel and experiencing different cultures. I have an idea that if I have kids one day, I'll get them home, homeschooled as well. But one yep. of the things that uh, uh, throws people off, I believe, is that, the, their idea of education is this thing kind of like a, a, a manufacturing, some sort of a product. It's like they, they always assume of this concept of having to make one become something else, like a specific thing. Whereas I feel like homeschooling for kids help just, it's an open ground for kids to just grow and be aware of things and learn as much as they can and kind of build up on what they want, to, they would like to become or what they would want to do. But I wonder to you, what, are, what specifically made you decide to, to, to homeschool your children? What, what do you find that's not appealing about the public school system? Well, in my case, it was easy because, because I was homeschooled. I grew up in a homeschool environment. It's the only schooling that I ever knew. So for me, it's more appealing than the, the public school system or private school system simply because those, to me, are very foreign systems. Now, my wife went to a, both private school and to public school um, her entire life. She was never homeschooled, um, and she was in favor of homeschooling because she had a lot of bad experiences uh, within those environments. She had good experiences as well, but she saw that, that um, there's a lot of bullying that takes place. Um, there's a, a lot of exposure to things that kids face. Um, at, at a very young age. So there were a lot of things that she saw as, as being criticism, criticisms of it. And I actually, she had wanted to homeschool her kids before she ever met me. So um, it just worked out really well for us that we were both in agreement and in alignment in terms of that. But for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a no-brainer. Uh, it is a no-brainer, excuse me, because I had never thought that I would ever do anything other than homeschool my kids because that's the form of education that my parents provided to me. Um, and I feel like it's important to do that for my kids as well. Fantastic. So let's jump into back into your childhood. Like, what did you wanted to become when you when you were growing up? Did you ever thought of becoming a journalist uh, at all? No, I actually had no interest in uh, in journalism when I was growing up. Um, I actually wanted to be a, a pastor and uh, an evangelist, a preacher. Um, and so I actually had 
um, wanted to go to seminary uh, when I was young, and that's what I wanted to do. And during my childhood, I had always planned to become a pastor one day, um, and I actually did. I became a, a, a youth pastor um, when I was a teenager and did that while working other jobs. And uh, actually, when I first got married, I only got into TV because I had three brothers who were news photographers. And while I was looking for churches to work in full time, um, I, I started working at 19 um, – excuse me, at 18 and 19, I was working as a news photographer part-time just to supplement income. Um, and when I was 20 years old, I finally did land a job with a church in Oregon, and I, my wife and I got married, and we moved to Oregon. So, And I thought that was it for me as far as television and broadcast was concerned. I didn't think I'd ever do it again. I had only done it just to kind of supplement my income while I was looking for ministry opportunities. And so I went full-time into ministry, and I did that for two years. Uh, my wife and I were a long way from home, and then we decided to move back to our both of our hometowns of El Paso. And when we went back, um, I did. I went back without a job, so I naturally went back to working part time as a news photographer again, just to make income. Um, and then we had our first daughter and our second daughter, and I decided that you know what, I, I got to make more money because I don't make enough money doing this. And so I worked to transition from behind the camera to in front of the camera. And, and meantime, I did continue to work in ministry. I spent 20 years total uh, working in ministry part-time while I was in broadcast. So I continued to do that, but I went the, the broadcast route just to supplement income, and it, it wound up turning into a full-fledged career. Uh, awesome. So that uh, the ministry career now is, uh, is completely over, or have you ever thought of returning? So I, I want to continue to do work in ministry. Um, you know, throughout my life, I'll always continue to do work. So I volunteer a lot now, um, and I continue to volunteer to do uh, mission work, and I continue to volunteer uh, for community projects here in Atlanta and, and in Cincinnati where we were living before this. Um, so I'll con always continue to do that. But in terms of doing it as uh, a, a full-time uh, job, no, I don't think I'll ever do that again. Okay, so when you went into um – the media, uh, you know, mainstream media, what's, you have had a quite a controversial career so far. When you just got into it, you know, started uh, being in front of the camera and getting attention and maybe you're making more money, what went wrong with you, uh, made you become more rebellious to the system? Well, well, I spent a long time, um, I, I like the term you use, rebellious. Uh, so <laughs> I really wasn't a, a rebellious to the system uh, for the first probably 12 years of my career. And so in the first 12 years, it was really was focused on uh, just being a good broadcaster and, and doing good work and good journalism. Um, and I've never actually sought to be rebellious to the system. Uh, but what began to happen really for me, the, the first major change was uh, in 2009, I was the anchor of an NBC station in, in El Paso, which is on the international border. So in the United States, you know, our border with Mexico, El Paso is the largest border city that borders with Mexico. And on the Mexican side of the border is a, is a massive city called City of Juarez. And Juarez is a, a home to about three million people. And so it's, it's actually the largest border plex in the world in terms of the – on both sides of the border. And so I was working as a news anchor at that time, and there was a, a massive drug war that broke out in Mexico across the country, and it came to northern Mexico and specifically to the city of Juarez. And I began to cover that story on a daily basis. I would cross the river, and I would report during the daytime of what was happening there. I would go back in the evenings, and I would work as an anchor, and I would deliver these stories. And I guess my first rebellion, if you will, came at that time because um, – there were a lot of national news outlets who would send reporters down to the border to cover what was going on. There were so many people dying in Juarez. It was the most dangerous city in the world at the time. There were thousands of people who were being killed there, um, dozens of people dying every single day in horrific ways. And so I would see these reporters come down, and, and I was covering the story every day. I was there in Mexico, and I would see what was going on. I would talk to people. We were reporting what was happening. But when the reports would make it to the national news – they were very, very different. They would be saying very different things than what we knew to be true. And so I began contacting some of those networks and saying, and their producers and saying, hey, listen, I'm, I understand you guys are down here. You're trying to cover the story. That's fantastic. Glad you're here. Uh, the story needs to be covered. But there are some things that you guys are saying that are untrue. Here's what's actually going on. And I would try to explain to them what was happening. And sometimes they would respond. Most of the time they wouldn't. 
They wouldn't change um, what they were saying, though. Regardless of what I said to them or even if they responded, they wouldn't change what they were saying. And what I began to realize was that the, the networks, when they would come down, had a preconceived storyline, a narrative that they already were pushing before they ever even got here, before they ever even saw what was happening. And so they weren't interested in what was actually happening on the ground or the root cause of what was happening. They cared about pushing the narrative that fit what they wanted. And so for me, that was kind of the first point at which I began to pivot away from my peers and my colleagues and began to say, uh, I don't care you know, if, what narrative everyone else wants to push. I'm going to report what's actually happening you know, regardless of, of what takes place. As we, we have to keep in mind that, you know, these news channels are businesses first. So yes. it's, it's, I stopped watching the news like a couple of years ago, uh, maybe six years ago, not six, seven years now. I don't really watch the news anymore, like mainstream news, specifically because of that reason. I find that it's almost impossible for them to actual, actually uh, give you know, delivering news that's actually true because of conflict of interest. So from that perspective of the story that you say there, how can, I mean, and you have been in the industry for a very long time, like how do you think one can digest news in this point in time, considering we have social media, which is, a, I think, good and a bad thing at the same time? How would you yes. d digest news to actually get the real truth out of it? with all the noise left and right. Right. So one of the things I, that I've always done is I've always asked a lot of questions. And so when something doesn't make sense, you question it. And then you look for answers. And, and what many times journalists do, so-called journalists will do, is they begin with where they believe they will arrive. And then they, look, they work backward to build a story that gets them to the conclusion that they've started with. And you and I both know you should never start with a conclusion. You start with a question. And the question leads you to another question, to another question, to another question. And, and as you ask questions and, and look for truthful answers and you look for facts and information that backs up those answers, it leads you in a direction. And so what I've tried to do is follow a pattern of questioning first and then learning from where those questions and answers take me. And that's ultimately where I, where I arrive. But if you start with the conclusion and then you try to figure out what the questions are, you're never going to arrive at an honest answer. You're always going to, to make the facts fit the conclusion. And I think that's what happens in so many cases. So in my case, it was, it was the opposite. It was always began with questions. And I will confess to you that throughout my career, that's been the number one criticism, criticism that I have had from other media is that he's always asking questions or he um, will talk about things that they don't deem appropriate to talk about, stories and, and issues that they don't deem appropriate. And they'll say that, that one of their big accusations against me is that I talk about these things and I hide behind asking questions. As if that's hiding, as if <laughs> as a journalist, that's the <laughs> primary of what I'm supposed to do is I'm not supposed to have answers. I'm supposed to be the questioner to people who do have answers. Yes. So, yeah, this is, this is a very interesting uh, thing right there. I think that's what, uh, I believe that's what led to this whole movement of independent media, uh, which I think it's a little, bo it's a little more, more different and liberal in terms of you know what one can do you know, the news anchor or you know the the content creator because they don't really rely on the infrastructure of corporates behind it but so from what you have seen now even in the um, independent media space do you think it's it's better it's getting better or worse because there is also a lot of money coming into that space at the moment uh, that's a good question um, I think that the space is becoming uh, very confusing because there is independent media and I think some do very good work. And I think there are some people who can do good work on some subjects and terrible work on others, right? So I really look at, at individual work as being, you know, what I look at and whether or not someone's intellectually honest in what they're doing. I think there is a lot of independent media, though, who has become so reliant on the need for advertising and, and clicks in order to survive that unfortunately, some of them 
will push towards uh, very sensationalized content or headlines in order to to get paid. And I understand the need to do that, uh, but unfortunately, I think overall it, it hurts journalism. On the other hand, the tech, big tech companies and tech giants have squashed independent media and their ability to be able to ask questions and their ability to be able to raise revenue. And so because they're squashing them, um, they also force a lot of those folks to, to try to do whatever they can. Right. Uh, almost like the story of Alex Jones, I suppose. So the thing is, what, what happens, what I've observed, uh, especially in the online community, is that the news channel or you know, the content creator, uh, the independent content creator, over time they create their own uh, little universe you know, with people who follow them, and then it reaches to a point where it's no different from the mainstream media, where they have to feed to their audience what yes. they know that their audience you know, like to believe or like to, to watch or listen to. Then it, it, it's that which is no different from Fox and CNN, whereas That's right. you're never going to see positive things about Trump on CNN or positive right. things about Obama on Fox. So I don't know. If, That's right. Do you think? No, that, no. I, let me just say. Yeah. I was just going to say, let me just comment on that because you're making a great point and it's, and it's a very important point. So one of the things I've tried to explain to people for a lot of years is that media creates these echo chambers, right? But it's actually self-defeating. So when when Fox started in 1996, the idea was there are all these conservatives out there who don't have a voice in media because the media is too liberal. And they were right. And they built an incredibly successful uh, news network from that concept. The problem is, is that once you get to the point where you have curated an audience of nothing but people who believe that their line of thinking, their way of thinking is correct and everything else is wrong. The, the reporters and the journalists who work in that system actually become slaves to that system because now you can no longer tell your audience there is, in fact, a different way of thinking on this issue or on this issue because the audience tells you, no, there isn't, and they want those reporters removed, and they want the reporter fired if a reporter says anything that's out of line with what is expected of the, the line, if you will, that's supposed to be towed. And so you have all these reporters who now become subject to it, and so the audience continues to control and it becomes a very small group of, of hyper-political, um, close-minded people who just want to be validated in what they believe. So what I tell people is news media in America does not educate people. People do not come to news media to be educated. They come to news media to be validated in the belief system that they already hold. Right on. So tell me that the thing that I believe is correct and I'll continue to watch you. But the moment you tell me the thing that I believe is correct, is incorrect, I won't watch you anymore. And that's, and that's the system that we've created. It's a terrible system. Yeah, yeah, you're actually right on on that. Uh, I think, yeah, we actually go online for validation. At Facebook, actually, I think, figured this out early enough that they just created algorithms to just show you things that you like. And then that's pretty much what affected your elections at one point. But let's move on, on to... I want to hear the stories of how you usually get fired uh, on on your contracts uh, with the previous with your previous employers. I suppose you've been fired a couple a couple of times. I wonder how this whole ha thing happens. Is it like a smooth kind of uh, talk, or do these people really get pissed with something that you pr probably put out? Well, I, I would say that um, the, the, I've had I've had bosses who are very unhappy with the direction things go in. And it's always, it's always interesting to me because it's, um, in every position, it becomes kind of a push and a pull, right? They like the fact that I've always been able to build an extremely large, um, interested, devoted audience with the content that I create. Because the audience looks at what I'm doing and says, well, here's a guy who's, who's doing something different, right? He's not trying to just tell me what I want to hear. He's actually telling me things that I may disagree with. And what's fascinating about that is I actually have a lot of people, and every time that I've ended up leaving someplace, who have contacted me afterwards saying, I'm grateful for the fact that even though I didn't agree with you a lot of times, um, you did tell me things in an honest way, and I always believed that you were being honest with me. 
And so we've always built an audience uh, that way. And so my bosses have always liked the audience that comes with it. They just don't like the subject matter. And so what they're always trying to figure out is how can we keep those audiences and grow the audience? Because remember, in broadcast television, it's a dying medium. It's not a growing medium. It's one that over the decades continues to decline and it declines every single year. It's a smaller audience every year watching broadcast news. And so they would always want to, well, how do, you know, you're growing the audience, so that's great. Maybe if we could just change what you're saying, then everyone will be happy, right? You'll be happy because you'll be able to do what you want to do. We'll be happy with the subject matter you're talking about, the audience. The problem is those things don't all fit together. Right, you can't change the subject matter that, and and the content that the audience comes for, um, if, because if you do, then the audience doesn't want to be there anymore. And if you um, go do change it, then the audience goes away. So it's it's always been kind of a a challenging thing, I think, for news managers who have worked with me, because on one hand you're growing the audience, on the other hand you're talking about things you really don't want you to talk about. So what led to all this was you, you know, doing some investi- investigative work uh, at the border of Mexico. What, what really was happening there? What was the story? Well, in the, in the story in Mexico, um, it really came down to the idea that the military and the government of Mexico were all working with one cartel to get rid of all the other cartels. And they were trying to create a super cartel that would basically be the, the only game in town, if you will. That was what was actually happening in Mexico. And so one of the, the claims that the media was making was that these rival drug cartels were all killing each other. And so it didn't matter because innocent people wouldn't be hurt because it's just you know violent people killing violent people, narcos killing narcos, which of course was not true. There were lots of innocent people being killed every single day. Um, you had lots of innocent people being kidnapped and held for ransom. And you had a city that was in complete chaos on every level. And you had government that was actually working with cartels, right? And so uh, one of the things I actually was able to find at one point when I was there on the border um, was Mexican military who were assisting drug cartels in some of their work and actually got them on video um, helping to protect cargo shipments that were being brought across the border. So there were a lot of things. And and I actually told my wife and my kids this the other day. We we found this old story. It goes all the way back to 2000 and I want to say 2000 and – uh, nine, uh, when this, or maybe even no, it was before that. It was like 2006 when we did this. And what was fascinating about it was that was actually the first story I was ever called a conspiracy theorist over, because I actually caught these guys on video, and the claims were, well, these were people dressed up as military. They weren't really military. You're trying to, you know, start an international incident. It was all these things that were <laughs> claims that were being made, and because no one wanted to accept the simple fact that we were able to captured that the Mexican military was not doing what they say they were doing, that the Mexican consulate was not representing what was actually happening there. So it was actually the first one. And then over the years, you know, we got more into politics and got into covering presidential elections. And over the years, it just kind of grew, 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 talking about foreign policy, what was happening in Syria, what's happening in Yemen. And, and those stories have never been well received either by, by those who were in power. By the public, yes, because they're learning something new. But by those who are in power, no, because it messes up their systems. All right. And you, you also kind of, uh, you like to talk about vaccines a lot. I wonder what's the story be, uh, behind vaccines. And let's just put it this way, actually, before we talk about vaccines. What, is, what are conspiracy theories to you? What does that word mean? Conspiracy theories. Right. So, uh, great, great, great question. Um, so to me, the, it's, it's, when anyone calls you a conspiracy theorist, right, it is a meaningless term that simply means... Um, it was, it was the term that meant fake news before people were saying fake news. It's untrue, based in, in some kind of wild belief and not based in fact. That's, that's how it's used. So I don't believe um, in referring to conspiracy theorists because I believe that there, that there are many conspiracies out there. There are people who conspire to do things all the time. Um, but I, I know what the, the, the term means in terms of uh, how it's used. The vernacular is used to smear someone like me without ever having to address the facts of what I'm saying. Right. So as an example, you're popular with the vaccine story. What exactly uh, is about vaccines that we, you know that most people don't seem to know or what you think the, uh, the mainstream media don't seem to, bro- to broadcast and why is the reason behind it? Sure. Well, the, the, the thing about vaccines is simply this. So my kids are vaccinated. I don't think vaccines are bad, but I believe 
simply this, from the research I have done, from the stories that I have done, and from the evidence that I have presented to the public, is simply this. Not all vaccines are safe for all people in all quantities at all times. That is not a radical statement to say that all people should not be given all quantities of vaccines at any age. Um, And yet, if you say that in this country, you are deemed to be a crazy person or someone who denies science. And yet the science shows us over and over that there are children who are harmed by vaccines. There are children who are vaccine injured. I did a story where we showed a massive number of, of payments that have been made by the U.S. government, Health and Human Services, to families of children who were vaccine injured because we have a system set up in the United States called Vaccine Court. And, and the Vaccine Court or the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, BICP, was set up in 1986 by Congress to say no one can sue a vaccine maker. And if your child is injured by a vaccine, then you have to go to this special court that is set up in order to prove that your child has been injured. And yet $40 billion has been paid out since 1986 to the families of children uh, who have been injured by vaccines. And so the idea that no one's ever injured by a vaccine is insane. It's just not true. That doesn't mean all vaccines are dangerous. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't get them. And yet when you make, I think, reasonable statements based in fact like that, Instead, you're treated as if you are a crazy person who doesn't believe in science. And yet those who don't believe in science are the ones who deny the fact that there are kids who are actually injured this way, which the evidence shows. Right. Yeah. Science, I think it's one of those words that these days everyone can use to just defend their points of view. It's like, uh, I, I think there's a confusion between absence of evidence and then existence. I've been reading a book recently by um, this guy called Nicholas Taleb. Uh, It's called Skin in the Game. So he argued about the same thing as right now in the mainstream media, or if you're trying to argue those kind of uh, scenarios, scientism seems more than science. It's like there's a lot of scientism other than science itself. But But at face value, scientism seems to be more um, like real science than science itself. So I think it's just a matter I of... I think that's <laughs> absolutely true. That's absolutely true. No question. And that's true on so many levels. If we're talking about global warming, if we're talking about the environment, if we're co- talking about vaccines, it's true of so many levels that scientism, that's correct, is is what is believed, not science. Right. So let's talk about crypto. Uh, you, I, 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 I cannot be surprised that you, you know, doing what you were trying to do on what you've been doing over the years, you ended up in the cryptocurrency market as well. Uh, just share with us exactly how you ended up into Bitcoin and uh, to where you are today. So in 2013, I was first introduced to Bitcoin uh, by Roger Ver. He explained to me what it was and was first introduced to it. I got some Bitcoin at that time. Unfortunately, I was independent, so I had to actually spend it at the time to survive, which I hadn't. Wish I had just held on to all that Bitcoin, um, but I wound up, you know, spending it, and then uh, at one point went back into the mainstream. But and when I was back in the mainstream here in Atlanta, I reached the point where um, a lot of the independent work I was doing was coming under such fire and was getting shut down uh, on so many levels, and, and knew that the only way to be able to ever go independent again would be if something truly dramatic happened. And that thing happened earlier this year when the crypto market went up very high. Um, a cryptocurrency called Dash, digital cash. Um, some of the guys who were involved in it came to me and said, look, Dash has a treasury system that actually allows for independent media to be funded or anybody to be funded who does marketing and so to get their name out there. And so you should put in a, a proposal to see if they will fund your work because you have a massive following. So I did. I put together a proposal. It actually was the largest proposal that Dash had ever um, received. There was one week until the end of the voting cycle, but I went ahead and put it in and we got approved. And we used that to launch independently and start creating content completely independent of, of any corporate structure. And, and we did that for four months, and um, unfortunately, the tr- crypto market started to decline, and as it, things contracted, Dash was unable to continue. But fortunately, we were able to uh, align ourselves with Smart Cash and do a similar deal where Smart Cash began um, funding us, and that's lasted uh, several months as well. The point being that what I found was that the only way for independent media to truly survive in, in the current environment is going to be to find funding sources independent of 
uh, what they've used in the past. And cryptocurrency provides that opportunity in a way that really no other funding model ever has before. Right. And also what's interesting there for me is that the way these funding models uh, in, crypt in the crypto market specifically, they're also decentralized. So even the ones issuing them, uh, the funds don't really have too much say other than the community they have to decide if they really want to do it. Because I have also that I made, right. a made a deal with Smart Cash before, and that wasn't the creators of Smart Cash themselves to decide. It was the community who votes if they really want to do it. I think Dash has the similar kind of uh, system as well. Yes, that's correct. And, and Smart Cash and Dash are both decentralized, which means the community votes. And that's a, I think that's a very good thing. It's a very healthy thing. Unfortunately, when that happens, there are some people who love who love you and some people who hate you. And, and yet they're all funding you, <laughs> so that becomes a little bit of a challenge. But that's okay. I mean, it's, I, I would rather have that kind of a system, a decentralized system, because then you don't have one or two people who are trying to dictate the content. So Dash and Smart Cash, one thing they have in common is neither of them have ever said, don't talk about this issue, or we want you to cover this. It's never happened. And I, and I think that's a rarity for any kind of sponsored content anywhere to not have some overlord telling you, uh, what you're going to talk about or what they don't want you to talk about. So it's it's been a great system for us and we've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. So lastly, you came up from a different uh, climate when it comes to media and journalism. And with, you know, with content creation was super hard. I suppose if you can compare when you started your own independent uh, company, uh, it's a little different now because uh, a 17-year-old guy can just wake up and you know get a little phone and start shooting and creating content and put it on youtube then it was That's different right. and how do you differentiate how do you compare the two uh in, in contrast like wh what are the opportunities what are the flows because from my perspective there's a lot of things being said about you know how social media is bad i think it's almost a, gen a generational thing as well but at the same time i feel like content and news must be a two-sided way of interactivity. You tell me something, you can ask questions, and you know someone can create his own, his own version of the same content, and I get to decide what I think uh, is right. Whereas back then, right. people used to watch television, and you know, there, there was no way to comment on it, or you know, to share, or you know, disagree, like, or dislike, all those things weren't, uh, weren't existing before. So I wonder what, how That's you right. look at it now. Well, I think it, there's a lot of opportunity now, whereas before, you're, you're absolutely right. It was very limited in who was allowed to be a quote-unquote journalist, who was allowed to investigate, and who was allowed to have an audience. Uh, it was very controlled, and, and now it's wide open. I think what's happened, though, is we've seen a shift take place, and the shift that's taken place is going from gatekeepers who have controlled information to now having um, these platforms, these social platforms where so many people can reach small audiences, large audiences, you know, whoever it might be. And so as a result of that, what, what I think we're seeing now is already another shift, right? So the shift went from my generation of journalists who, who you got to do it through a, a broadcast station, you have to do it through a network, you got to do it through somebody legitimate, to the shift to social media of, well, now you can just create it yourself. It can be high quality, it can be low quality, it can be somewhere in between. But now we've already had a third shift, which is for social platforms to say, actually, we're not going to allow that. We're going to censor and get rid of those who are coming to our platform who are not considered, quote unquote, legitimate journalists. And so we're av and we've actually been watching the purge of a lot of these people from social platforms. And, and I, if, if I may, that's one of the reasons why our new project um, using crypto is going from the independent funding model to actually building the platform. Because what we've seen is you can be a content creator, but if there are no platforms for you to place that content, there's, you'll never survive, number one. And number two, no one will ever see you. So we're actually in the process now of building a, a, a full-on streaming network. It's called ICE Network, I-S-E Network. Um, the word is short for Isagoria, a Greek word that means equality and the freedom of speech, the freedom to speak. And so what we've done is we've created a, um, a plan. We're, we're working on it right now to develop a full media platform for videos and podcasts, uh, for docudramas, for episodic series, for news content, and then also have channels where independent content creators can come and they can actually get their content placed on these channels. 
But there may be content creators who say, well, I, I have some great ideas, but I can't afford to create anything. We're also building into our system a treasury system that will allow us to fund those independent content creators. And our users will actually be able to vote on content just like in the smart cash model and in the dash model. We'll be able to look at that and say, here's the treasury. We're going to vote on projects and get them funded and get them created. So we're actually now building a platform because as a journalist, I know you can create great content. But if the platforms refuse to show it, there's no point in making it at all. We've got to have a platform that allows for that content to be shown to the masses. Fantastic. Um, so is that a global platform where any, anybody, anybody can, can publish or it's just an, an, an American-based uh, platform? So, it, so it's not up and running yet. It will begin as an American-based platform. It will become a global platform. That is our plan, is to make it as global as possible. All right. So lastly, maybe let me ask you this. If you have such a platform, now you are the Google of that, um, say in the next couple of years, you are the, the actual platform that people want to go and uh, you know, watch their favorite shows and news and whatever. Um, yeah. If you have Alex Jones on there, uh, yeah. who, you know, it's questionable whether what he does is, is news or comedy or a mix of both but then it's being delivered right. as news. What would be your responsibility on that? Or what do you think about the concept of Alex Jones himself? So here's what I believe. I believe that people have a right to speak. And the freedom to speak, the freedom of speech, which we hold very highly in our Constitution, um, at least we're supposed to, is a, a freedom that is a, it does not require you to be sincere, it does not require you to be good, and it does not require for you to even be right. And so one of the things that's happened within our, our current system is that we have adopted a belief that the freedom of speech does not include controversial things. Right. That's a very good point. Uh, and so I apologize. My, my, um, can you hear me clearly still? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I was going to say, so, so you do not have to be right. And, and what we truly believe is that the censorship should come from individuals. Individuals have a right to self-censor. And so it shouldn't be up to Google or Facebook or me to decide whether or not someone should hear a particular point of view. Instead, it should be up to the user to say, I heard what you said and I disagree with you. And so I'm going to go listen to someone else or I'm going to debate you. They have many choices in it. But it shouldn't be that a, a tech provider decides whether or not your voice is legitimate for the public. Because even if you're well-intentioned in doing that, there is nothing positive that comes from that in terms of the public. The public is not made stronger because of the exclusion of voices. The, the public is not made stronger even because of the exclusion of, of deceptive voices or wrong voices. Having more voices makes us stronger. Allowing people to be exposed to viewpoints makes them more intelligent. And it allows people to become more open in terms of their worldview. Uh, the system we have now that says it's protecting us is not. It's simply propagandizing us. Right. I agree on you on that. At the same time, I think uh, it, some of the content, it's just better off being categorized properly. It's like if Alex Jones would come and say, you know, he's running some kind of a comedy show that that would be a, a different model but like if you if someone's come coming in claiming to be delivering news i think it's it's a different paradigm i don't you you're definitely familiar with the story of peter Thiel and goker because you know where yes. he had to sue them and run them bankrupt simply because you know they crossed the line of uh, hum, uh they use freedoms of speech as a capsule to just you know to 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 just to get to gain attention by publishing some kind of information that are rather personal that has nothing to do with the economy or, right. or the market, which I believe right. is almost the same with uh, with Alex Jones. You know, if you talk about different types of people on different type of models that you barely have no evidence to show, <laughs> uh, and right. then you know you actually p constantly publish it as news, I think that's uh, that's a little different than just well, I, and I, I agree speech. with that. I agree with that, but think about what, what actually happened with, with Gawker. Gawker was told, take down the Hulk Hogan video, and they refused. And Hogan said, I don't want it up, and they refused. And so there was the recourse for him 
because he had backing by Peter Thiel, was to be able to say, okay, then because you are acting in bad faith, because we believe you have overstepped the lines, you're not news. You're simply smearing people. You're simply airing their their personal um, actions in a way that is designed to basically humiliate and make fun of them. Um, we're going to sue you for it. And what's interesting is is that um, Gawker's demise was in its own model because it was disingenuous. If Gawker had said it was something else, if Gawker had attempted to be something else. So I think there are other ways to be able to deal with bad players, which clearly Gawker was. Um, there's other ways to deal with them than to simply just shut them down. So I agree with you. Maybe, maybe it's a process of, of properly categorizing, um, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be heard. Absolutely. Ben, this was fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time. I don't want to steal too much of your time, but this was great as expected. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Hello once again, and that was the end of our conversation. And just before you go, just want to communicate a few things with you uh, quickly. If you have uh, enjoyed any of the podcast or this specific podcast episode, I would appreciate it if you share it with your friends and family through your social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc., etc., as well as write me a five star review on iTunes or Apple Podcast app. That would be fantastic. It helps me flourish and sustain this podcast as well. Uh, we also on other platforms like SoundCloud, uh, Stitcher Radio. Um, and all other major podcast platforms. So whichever way you're listening to it, I would appreciate it if you leave me a review. You can also subscribe to The Grey Podcast through my website, greyjabesi.com, G-R-E-Y-J-A-B-E-S-I.com. There you also find some of the blogs that I'm writing sometimes, and you get notified as soon as the new episode has been published. Until next time, enjoy and be productive.